Okay. General Awali, Director Clause, Chair, esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, again, uh, I will join everybody else in thanking General Aluwalia for having allowed some time for us to speak. The Chair has taken the thunder away in a thunderous manner and uh, nothing left us with nothing to speak. But uh, okay, since I have got the responsibility, I will do so. In yesterday and today, uh, talking of grey zone, I got confused. There were widely uh, differing views on grey zone since yesterday morning and today. So actually, it is a confusing thought. And that's where I start today, uh, talking of grey zone and grey zone warfare. In the course of last two months, in uh, Indian Army itself, two full journals have come out exclusively on grey zone warfare. The pinnacle from our track, all articles on grey zone. And the Senjos, the Center for Joint Warfare Studies has come out this month, uh, uh, last month, uh, uh, entire issue is on grey zone warfare. And IDSA came out with a book called um, Hybrid Warfare in last year. So you can imagine the amount of pressure being brought about um, on these issues of grey zone or hybrid warfare. Just to balance it out, the clause came out with something on land warfare strategy. Okay. Uh, Grey zone has been in deliberations for long. I am not going to talk about the differences between nature and character of war here because I am from the school of thought personally that the nature is changing but that's a contentious issue and I am not going to deliberate but my personal belief is that the nature is also changing as much and we need to jettison the uh, thought process of talking repeatedly about nature, nature and character. Those are past tense 200 years ago. We are a different era altogether and we want to, we need to talk differently. Language has to change. A lingo can't be of the 19th century. Let me set the contest in saying, what is war? Why, why do we call grey zone as warfare? What is war? And when you take all the definitions out of warfare, the problem is that war and warfare have very rigid def definitions over a very long period of time. And the military doctrines everywhere are designed to respond to that definition of warfare, which comes to be prolonged conflict, uh, state actors, non-state actors, extreme violence, social disruption, weapons being used. United States says, United Nations says it's a, uh, a war of aggression is a crime against international peace, etc. It is war. So war is a situa situation where a nation enforces its, its will by using actual force. Is grey zone a warfare of this kind which has been defined as warfare which is prevailing uh, definitions across the world including by the United Nations? And we, when we commonly talk about warfare it takes us to where? It takes us to killer robots. It takes us to what the chair, uh, Jan Saha, recently just spoke about machine augmented soldiers, lasers, hypersonic weapons, battles in space. Actually, modern warfare is much more beyond this combat that we are talking about. In a sens sensationalism of the high tech weaponry build, blinding us on the broader, it blinds us on the broader constructs of social, political, and cultural issues. I'll put my head on the news and state that the larger intellectual challenge is blinkered conception of frequently quoting clause bits without even actually thinking of revising the phenomena and talk about war. It's time we moved beyond clause bits. This is a different era altogether. And why do I presume that there are flawed conceptualization of war, contemporary war as far as uh, larger nations are concerned, also India, are three. There are simplistic and jingoistic views of adversaries and the context un under which the wars get triggered. Second, there is only a very an excessively basic understanding by the politicians and the bureaucracies on the application of military power and what it will evidently achieve and what measures victory or success. And third, the public at large has unreasonable expectations of quick wins at low cost. So in this confused paradigm came the lexicon of grey war or grey zone warfare. It 
actually takes to bring the uh, bridge the chasm between war and peace between routine safe craft statecraft and all out open war why did great uh, gray zone come up at this time of life or this this stage of uh, of um, uh, discussions two issues first this breakdown is of national there's a breakdown of national institutions in large number of countries and this comes because social media has overturned the importance of uh, newspapers and hierarchical dissemination of information information is now horizontally available so there is a breakdown in national institutions as to how they function and second there is a revision there is a resurgence of revisionist states all over the world and non state actors which matter and since they are revisionist states the method being employed are all beyond conventional war till date there has been a lack of discipline in defining gray zone warfare it is cause so much of ambiguity in what gray zone warfare and somebody keeps talking hybrid and gray zone as if they are synonymous to each other and if they mean same or identical which is actually not true there are two different types and two different typologies in that manner the impulse is to call gray zone war or warfare is strong and it's being used tremendously around here and that is also important to give it a military hue because the military men men in uniform want to prefer that all types of warfare belongs to them so that's why gray zone has been taken over as a warfare how are this so called battle space needs decluttering between what the wars are that use force and what are the wars which do not use force which are unregulated and actually uncluttered unregulated competition understanding this difference between a definition of war between what use of force implies and what non use of force implies would actually allow us to think about response options against uh, in this manner <clears throat> this is what been state uh, laid down by uh, stated by the us state department on what is the ambit of gray zone warfare when as you go over the entire series of issues laid down uh, uh, you see that there is just no mention of a full conventional war it is resistance is uh, propaganda covert operations special forces operations support logistic etc terrorist movements ngos irregular military forces economic pressures manipulation i'll cover some of these issues subsequently ambiguity and some threat and implicit threat of use of force which actually does not imply that there is any semblance of conventional warfare per se in what has been termed as gray zone warfare now for the purpose of uh, proceeding ahead and actually bringing out the characteristics of what we should expect in a gray zone warfare one must define it in a manner that it is uh, it is allows us to proceed further on the discussion so so to do that there is a definition that i have picked up which i thought suited the best it gives the gray zone environment can be taken as a state between peace and war where adversaries aim to achieve geopolitical and territorial ends without overt without i say without overt military aggression and crossing the threshold of open warfare which is one of the most significant differences that it has with hybrid warfare where where conventional operations would form part and parcel of hybrid warfare a gray zone is a gray zone which doesn't present it could escalate on its own to conventional wars this is a separate issue but gray zone operation larger measure are between the white and the black and that's why most of the slides in my suit also is gray i will delve on the characteristics now for the <clears throat> obviously the gray zone is a concept of gaining strategic advantage over an adversary with the breadth of um, uh, operation that can be only limited by imagination we can deem a set of operations but it can be anything which a man can imagine a person can imagine Con contextually <laughs> therefore for the assimilative purpose i am actually forecasting seven basic characteristics of 
uh, gray zone warfare and I will exemplify each one of these issues as it uh, relevant to our recent history as events have progressed over some time. And first and foremost is <coughs> gray zone campaigns are no, typically non-military in nature. They employ diplomatic, international, informational, cyber, militias, terrorists to avoid impressions of outright, outright military aggression. They are planned in a manner that they remain below the threshold of a military response, well short of established triggers for military action. Grey zone campaigns typically would not threaten the defender's vital or existential interests. The aim of grey zone warfare is to avoid major clashes, retain ambiguity, avoid violations of international law and norms or any outright conflict. The all, this all important characteristic that is it is typically non-military in nature guides the choice of specific actions like like going into South China Sea, a totally non-military action and occupying a large tract of area without fighting a, a war, absolutely non-military in nature. The aggressor balances belligerent actions and then also tries to placate the other parties by ca causing a ruse or causing a deception in that manner. This actually ties down the people who are in the recipient tent of grey zone warfare how to respond. The response become increasingly difficult because of the non-military and non-aggressive nature of grey zone warfare. The second major characteristic is that grey zone operations is that they unfold over a long period of time. An aggressor could plan an, a grey zone warfare, grey zone operation over say 10 years or 15 years. So they unfold over a long period of time as to what exactly has been wanted. And then they, they, that involves bold all encompassing actions by stretching surreptitious but aggressive moves over years and decades. Grey zone op operations using proxies would refer to provision of terrorist equipment or other enablers to proxy forces military active in the targeted country. In this manner, an important quality of grey zone campaign therefore is that the recipient country has to go face a series of fait accomplis on which it is not able to respond in time because it is not clear that they are under a kind of aggression. So it is the belief is that it is routine but there are fait accomplis being thrust on a recipient nation over a long period of time. As an example, for example you say use of proxies it was those green men as you see little green men disguised soldiers as proxies they played a key role in Russia and Crimea in, uh, in Crimea in 2014 war by a proxy by sending military personnel into fight without identifying insignia and then there are a number of proxies come into mind from Hamas to Hezbollah to Lashkar -e Taiba. they are all proxies fighting on behalf of somebody else and with stated ambiguity as to who is supporting them and then of course these are part and parcel of a grey zone warfare. The third major characteristic that comes to mind of a grey zone warfare is lack of attributability. It is largely attempting to be non-attributable. Most grey zone uh, campaigns involve actions in which aggressor aims to disguise the role at least to some degree whether using cyber attacks or disinformation campaigns these actions allow a grey zone aggressor to deflect offensive response by simply denying that it was responsible. In one of the uh, uh, recent phenomena was uh, some rockets fired on Israel from Syria where it was blamed on Iran. The Iranians said that we can't, we can't be involved into these rockets. If we had fired you have been hurt. You would have been hurt. So who fired those, you know, there is always an ambiguity left out in this whole game. In an October 2017 hearing before the US Senate Judiciary Committee, lawyers for Twitter revealed that 1.4 million tweets had originated from Russian bots during the 2016 presidential campaign. In December 2015, I think the chair took 30 minutes here. Okay. Uh, okay, there are campaigns of all kinds. Okay, I'll go. I'll go faster. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, then Estonia is a great example to be done this way that um, uh, then several banks newspapers were all got affected some of the actions can even be attributable people uh, in these cases they can be characterized by fourth common aspect the use of extensive legal and uh, political justifications often grounded in historical claims with documentation one can place the Indo-China border negotiations on a plane of a open and attributable grey zone warfare where things are deliberately delayed over a long period of time. Another example could be the South China Sea negotiation and the court um, settlement that came up in from Hague with Philippines and all those issues are all legal ju justifications to grey zone warfare. A fifth characteristic of grey zone warfare is that while remaining under the threshold military response, the aggressor forcefully propagandizes the risk of escalation as a source of leverage which was stated some time ago about the <coughs> TNWs. Now, closer home, it could be the mention of nuclear bogey or the use of TNWs as a deterrent against conventional war, which is used as proxies. Sixthly, is the issue of the aggressors planning to establish economic interdependencies that create implicit long-time leverages. It is a fact of the matter, I mean, one could state that the Belt and Road Initiative is a type of grey zone warfare which ties large number of countries into their apron strings of economic uh, ties with Chinese and which will be a long term effect that can be made as a type of a grey zone warfare. One could also refer to the FATF proceedings as a type of grey zone warfare which, uh, which ties on Pakistan in very many ways. And lastly and more importantly, the grey zone campaigns target specific vulnerabilities of target countries. This is what the chair also referred some time ago. And I think it is important for us to remember this. The grey zone aggressors will place where defenders cannot respond quickly or effectively. This can be political polarization, social cleavages, religious cleavages, ethnic problems, unemployment, economic stagnation, and the resulting need for grievances. And all these existing in a nation can be actually fanned well as part of a grey zone campaign. This is a method to find societal divisions to undermine and erode confidence in democracy, confidence in the leadership, as also confidence in the military leadership. Now, to effectively respond to this, and this is my last part of the presentation, is that there is there has to be a strategy that firstly, which needs to identify the ambit of grey zone operation. It's not an easy task. Such actions are purposely deceitful, and the operations can be constantly upscaled, downscaled, stopped, started again, there can be new ones added, the identification of initial actions by adversary state or non-state actors with plausible deniability is first one. Second is, the responses must be crafted to adversarial grey zone operations. Obviously, they have to be proportional, commensurate, timely and limited in nature. The strategy is important. I have a elaborate strategy, but I take it on in the question answer session. But just suffice it to say, I have four points to make here. First is, this is a transparent era. The transparency is most important in all our doings, including uh, in militaries. And there is where I think at least we have been lacking significantly, even in India and across into the armed forces. So strategy must come into grips with this essentially opportunistic gap-seeking character of gay zone. Second, Deterrence has to be evolved even into grey zone. We seem to be self-deterred. When we say TNWs, we get self-deterred. We have to develop our own methodology of deterrence, which is not a deterrence of the conventional or the nuclear kind. There has to be a separate methodology altogether. Third is, the bureaucracies and politicians have to adapt themselves. Nations keep on developing ex and they have to develop and exercise scenarios before a grey zone crisis occurs so that decision makers and analysts can come out with possible answers to lay down the groundwork for effective and timely reaction. And finally is that most of our nations are developing in a manner that we need to create the resilience of civil societies. Our civil societies are significantly, uh, uh, I mean they face the wrath and they react. The resilience of civil society's creation is a national pro product. Grey zone is not a military campaign. It's a national campaign and it has to be accepted in a national manner. I might add that nations and hierarchies also need to get more risk tolerant as also tolerant to criticism. Militaries keep sharpening the claws and sharpening the claws. I don't mean claws. Uh, I mean claws. 
and uh, sharpening their claws and sharpening their uh, swords. But that doesn't help so much in a grey zone warfare. It helps, but not so much. We need to start thinking that we there is something new on us. Grey is the new black. The black will happen one time in 50 years or may not happen. But grey is the new black. It's the new normal. I rest here, Chair. Thank you.